Hey everybody, in this presentation I'm going to be giving some tips and tricks on lighting inside of Maya and working with traditional lights, things like point lights and spotlights and area lights. And primarily we're going to be talking about linear lighting workflow. So there's been a lot of other tutorials done with um, image-based lighting workflows that use a color managed pipeline. And all of those tutorials and all those concepts actually apply to working with traditional lights inside of Maya also. So for those of you who haven't um, dove into linear lighting, which I'm sure almost everyone has at this point, this I'll, I'll kind of start off with a really quick little overview of, of why we need to do that. Basically, human eyes don't perceive light in a linear fashion. We're not sensitive to the mid-ranges of light. So almost any APIT image that you use will have some sort of gamma correction or color profile applied to that to compensate for our inability to see it correctly. So if you look at this graph, you can really clearly see that if we have you know, the input voltage um, as it as it kind of moves through here, the light perceived is a little bit different. So if you supplied a pixel on screen with 50% of the input voltage, so it's 50% of a value on screen, without any color profile or color management applied to that, we're only going to perceive that as being 20%. You know, it's not going to be a mid gray. It's going to be a dark gray. So to get around that, basically again, color profiles are added onto the images so that we perceive them correctly. So if we look at this grayscale image here, we're basically dropping down in value in 10% chunks. And you can really see that there's not a lot of change between 70, 80, and 90 because we haven't applied any color correction or color gamma correction to this to, uh, to compensate for the eye's inability to see it correctly. So if we look up at the next one that has an sRGB profile applied to it, you can see that we get this very clear 10% changes in, in value going through this color swatch. So really it's, it's just giving the... Um, the eye something appropriate to look at by using this managed workflow. Now the problem is when it comes to rendering, you really don't want to render images that have all this gamma correction applied to it because when you start lighting them, funky things will happen. So whenever you're working with the images and you're, you're applying math operations, so rendering calculations or compositing operations on them, you want to be doing that in a linear space. And then the, the last step or in the viewer you want to apply some type of gamma correction or some type of lookup to make the eye see it correctly. So when it's working in, in math, it's happening. It needs to be in a linear space. And then when it comes time for the, for the viewer to, to see the image, you need to compensate for the viewer or the eyeball's inability to see it correctly with this gamma correction or this color profile. So that's it at a kind of high level. Like I said, there's lots of other tutorials out there that go really into depth with it. Dig them up, you'll find them, it'll make perfect sense. But it, it really is, that's the basics of it is. You work in linear space, you view it in a managed space. And Maya has tools for doing that. And a lot of people use these tools when working with high dynamic range images. But basically what I'm saying is you should always be using a color managed workflow, whether you're using image-based lighting or not. So let's go ahead and jump over to uh, another little render layer setup here. And what I have in this thing is I've got two, um, two spotlights inside of Maya. They both have volumetric fog turned on. And this is what a spotlight with fog looks like. And the fog is just for us to visualize the intensity of that light. And by default, what Maya does is it has no decay set up on the light. So the intensity is the same at the beginning as it is at the end. And that's not really realistic for spotlights, point lights, area lights, things like that. There's, there's a quadratic decay in the real world. So if you want your lighting to look good in CG, the first thing you need to do is change your light to have quadratic decay. And this is what a lot of people did, you know, many, many years ago. You turn that quadratic decay on, the light's not going to be as bright, so we'll just pump that up to something like 20. And we'll re-render this guy, so we'll save that out. We'll render it off again. And you can see with that quadratic decay, it's really contrasty and poppy, and that light doesn't penetrate very far. It drops off extremely quickly. And this is why most early CG work looked really bright, in one spot and then it went really dark right next to it really quickly. And the reason it happened was because people weren't using a color managed workflow. They weren't working linearly than with an RGB lookup, an sRGB lookup at the very tail end. So this really doesn't look correct. It's not good. It's, and this is why most people never turn quadratic decay on their lights and it's why things were hard to make look really good. So if you, if you basically go and use a color managed workflow, you're going to get photorealistic looking results with traditional CG lights much quicker than you would if you tried to hack it without a color managed workflow. So the color management inside of Maya is in a couple different areas. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to change what type of image we're going to write to disk. We're going to say enable color management. So the default input, so this is your texture maps that are coming into Maya. We're going to say those are sRGB. And remember I said we wanted, to, we wanted all the math to happen in a linear space. So if you have your default input profile set to sRGB, that's telling Maya 
the images that come in, the TIFFs, the JPEGs, the Photoshop files that come in, assume they're 8-bit images and they have this RG, sRGB profile on them, suck that out and make them linear. So the rendering engine has nice, clean images to work with in a linear color space. The next thing that we want to do is we also want to tell Maya to output a linear image. You want to keep your images in linear space as long as possible. The last step is to apply a lookup to that linear image to compensate and make the eye see it correctly. So on your viewer, you can apply a lookup or in your compositing application, the last step would be to apply this sort of gamma correction for the, uh, for the end viewer to, or the eyeball to, to receive it correctly. So the output that we want to render to disk is a linear RGB file. So we're degamming our images coming in, the sRGB images. We're going to render in a linear space. We're going to save our file off the disk in a linear space. And then what we want to do is we want to basically, we'll render this out before I change the, the color management on this side. Notice that it's really bright, really dark, and it's not even, you know, there's no luminosity over here. So what we want to do is we want to go back to our viewer and start modifying the color management just on the render view. So what we are going to tell the render view is the image that's feeding this, the input color image, isn't sRGB anymore. It's now a linear file. And we're going to apply to that an sRGB profile. So we basically have now just put that gamma correction on in the viewer. And you can see now we have this really nice kind of mid-range push that's happening from that sRGB profile. The light goes really far into the scene now. So that's basically what you need to do to get lights looking realistic inside of Maya. Put quadratic decay on them, render, render, render them out as linear files, and then at the very last step, apply an sRGB lookup or color profile to the viewer. So let's turn all this stuff off and see this in a more practical example with some actual geometry. So we'll turn off our <clears throat> all of our color correction stuff that we turned on. And we'll jump over to another render layer that I have set up here that's got an area light in it. So what we've got here is we've got just a standard Maya area light. And there's a few different things that we're going to look at in this. So let's go ahead and render this guy out. So the first thing that we're going to do is render out this as um, we haven't changed any default settings on that area light. So this is just a simple Maya area light. You can see the quality of the area light shape in this reflected ball. It's not that great. So we'll save this out. And the first thing when working with area lights, so area lights are a little bit different than the other lights inside of Maya, the point lights and the spotlights. When working with area lights inside of Maya in conjunction with mental ray, there's a couple of different attributes that you need to play around with that are going to change the way they work different than the point lights and the spotlights. So let's go ahead and talk about those really, really quickly. And we'll also be enabling a linear workflow at the same time. So the first thing you want to do when working with an area light inside of Maya is turn it on, go to the air, uh, mental ray section, area light, use light shape. So when you say use light shape, this makes it a native mental ray area light. And there's a couple of different attributes, high samples, high sample limit, and low samples. And we'll, we'll talk about those in just a second. But let's go ahead and render this guy out now as a, as a mental ray area light. We're going to go ahead and we're going to turn this into, well, we'll render it first without quadratic decay. So you can see it kind of comes out, doesn't look that great. Next, we'll go in here and we'll put the quadratic decay on. <clears throat> so this is going to make it have light that drops off correctly. Um, again, you have to increase the intensity. If your scene's really big, don't, don't be shocked by massive values in the intensity. So with quadratic decay turned on, this is a non-color managed workflow right now. So we turn quadratic decay on and you can see we get that, that really bright hot spot and then it goes to black really, really quickly. There's no information over here in the upper right hand corner. So that it's just that super sharp drop off that we saw before because it's not being managed properly. It's not color managed. So what we want to do is we want to go back and do that same stuff we did with the spotlight. So we'll go to our color settings or our render settings, enable color management, tell it that we want to have a linear file written to disk. We can re-render that guy now out with this linear file being written to disk. And the next thing that we need to do is jump into our color management settings and say the input image that this viewer is taking is actually a linear file and we want to have this sRGB gamma correction applied to it. And you can see now how we have this really nice, you know, it's no longer just a super hot spot over here in the left hand corner that drops off really quickly to a black spot in that right hand corner. We have all that nice kind of mid range value there. And that's because we're using quadratic decay in conjunction with a color managed linear workflow. That's really the two concepts that we want to kind of drive home here. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is a couple of different attributes on the spotlights that are, or on the area lights when you're working with mental ray area lights that are kind of a little different. Let's, let's zoom in on this image here and pop our focus over to uh, 
oops, wrong one, to that area light. And we're going to jump down here to talk about high samples, high sample limit, and low samples. So this is something that's a little bit different um, on the area lights. And if we render this out, these are what control the quality of the shading of the area light, including the shadows. So on area lights, a little bit different. This actually controls how grainy the ray trace shadows are going to be in that area light. So if you have the larger the area light, the higher the samples you need to have to make it have not a grainy look to it. And the same thing can be said for the overall shading of that area light as it moves through your scene here. So if we drop this high sample down to a value of 1, we'll save this image out right here. This is at 8. If we drop it to a 1, you'll see that all through here it's going to start to look kind of grainy, right? You can see all that graininess that's happened inside of there. Notice the graininess in the reflective ball also. So if we put that high samples up to something like 16 and render it out, we'll save that image at 1, and we put it up to a value of 16, you can basically see we now have smooth lighting here. It's not grainy anymore, but look at the reflection. The, 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 the surface and the reflection still is grainy. And the reason it's still grainy is because the reflections are using the low sample count. So it's still using one sample on the reflected sphere. And so the high samples are basically the, um, the, first, the first ray. The low samples are going to be the minimum number of, bound, uh, of samples you can have. And the sample limit is how many bounces in does it have to go until it jumps to the low sample limit? So basically, if I put this to a value of 2 here, this is just one bounce in. So if I put my high sample limit to 2, these guys on this reflective sphere are actually going to be using the high sample count of 16 because it hasn't gone a number of bounces. It hasn't exceeded the number of bounces before it kicks into the low threshold. So you can see that it's now smooth. So what happens is if I put this back to 1 and I put my low samples up to 16, well, we've lost no ability for it to adaptively change the sample count based on how many rays are bouncing around. So this is the same. You would never do this. You basically want to, at some point, say, you know what? These, 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 um, these samples, don't. they've gone so many bounces into my scene that's a reflection of a reflection of a reflection. I don't need those to be super shaded. So, you know, I always run that something maybe around 4. 16, 4, 32, 8, you know, you sort of run run powers of 2 on these guys, at least I do. And I pretty much leave it my sample bounce at 1. So if we render this guy out, these guys on that sphere now are going to get 4 samples. The reflected surface gets 4 samples. The non-reflected surfaces are getting 16 samples. And again, the sample limit adjusts how many reflections of reflections does it take or how many, how many times does a ray have to bounce before it kicks into that low sample threshold. And again, these sample counts, when you're doing area lights, control the shadows. So if we go in here and we turn on Use Ray Trace Shadows, and you have grainy shadows in your scene with area lights, and this is only specific to area lights, you'd think, well, heck, my shadows are grainy. Let me crank up those shadow rays. That's going to have zero impact on area lights. If you crank the shadow rays on a point light, a directional light, um, you know, a spotlight, something that's got some, uh, some some light angle or some size to it. These shadow rays do very much control how grainy the shadow is, but with area lights and mental ray, the shadow rays don't do anything. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is a, a value that's set by default inside of Maya, which I, I kind of have a problem with, is the ray depth limit is set to 1, and that is just silly to me. Um, ray depth limit adjusts how many reflect? How many bounces can a shadow show up in? So, but this ray depth limit is set to one, and this is what all the lights inside of Maya are set as default. Notice that there's I have shadows right here, right? There's a shadow right here. Look at this reflection. There's no shadow information in that reflection because the ray limit ray depth limit is set to one. So, every time you make a light, I turn that ray depth limit to two, and obviously that's going to give you know at least one bounce in. You want to see. Um, you want to see shadows one bounce in. So now if we flick between these two, you can see the drastic difference between those, you know, all the, look at underneath the spaceship, right? Setting that light, that bounce to two lets the, the ship get shadowed properly and the sphere get shadowed. So this is a value in Maya by default that's set to one, pretty much always change up to two. So the three big concepts um, when working with lights and specifically area lights inside of Maya are you want to use a linear workflow, a color managed workflow. You want to set your decay rate to quadratic for any light 
if you want it to look realistic, and you need to really make sure that you turn that rate up limit up to a value of two. So hopefully this makes sense to you guys, and if you have any, any questions, just hit up the chat that's below the movie and I'll, I'll try to answer them. Thanks a lot for your time, everybody.